All this comes, of course, as that work continues to try to find a longer-term vaccine for coronavirus. And joining me now is Director General of the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul, South Korea, Jerome Kim. Thanks very much for being with us on the programme today. I mean, many countries around the world then are starting to think how we can start, perhaps, to come out of lockdown. Longer term, though, of course, uh, what we really need is a vaccine. How close do you think we are? Many people have talked about a benchmark of 12 to 18 months, but that benchmark assumes that everything works well, that the vaccine goes through the initial three stages of testing in humans without a hitch, that in the final analysis in the phase three study, that the vaccine is found to be both safe and effective in the prevention of uh, COVID-19 infection and disease. Now, everyone says, well, 12 to 18 months, that's a long time, but in fact, usually, it takes us five to 10 years to develop a vaccine. So this vaccine has been moving with unprecedented speed from the time that CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, first issued its call for proposals to the, to, uh, the first injection of a vaccine in humans uh, March 17th, uh, was just three months. And now additional companies have announced that their first in human clinical trials have started. And again, uh, this is faster than, than we've moved for any other vaccine. So presumably uh, the worry is if the vaccine is rushed, it could turn out to be uh, dangerous or not effective. Um, but if it's too slow, many more people could die. Yes, it's, it's a careful balance. It's much more likely that the vaccine you know, might not work. Uh, only one in 10 vaccines actually goes all the way from the laboratory uh, through clinical testing and is found to be effective and is eventually marketed. So there is a big dropout rate, which is one of the reasons why organizations like CEPI or the United States government or the Chinese government are exploring so many different potential vaccine candidates, because you're really, um, there are really too many unanswered questions that are, that are um, you know, a bit troubling, but we have to move forward because, as you said, you know, we, ha we don't have the luxury of time. You talk about those unanswered questions. I mean, one of them, for example, I know that you're very concerned about is whether people do become immune and not just immune in the short term, but in the long term as well after infection. Yes. And, and you know, there's some evidence that would suggest that um, people who've been infected with COVID-19 may be immune to, to another infection. And why, why is that important? It's because that means that the body was capable of mounting the kind of defensive or immune responses that will suppress el and eliminate the virus in the first place and then protect a person against uh, further infection. That would make it much more likely that a vaccine could do the same thing. But there are some other unanswered questions. You know, we don't know what the protective, right protective immune responses are. We don't know that there's an animal model that will accurately predict uh, whether humans will be protected, because if we had that, we'd go straight to that animal model and show that it works, and then we'd be relatively confident that the vaccine might work in humans. We don't know that a vaccine that's developed is safe, and remember, vaccines are given to healthy people to keep them healthy. So safety is one of the, you know, the most important things we do when we develop a vaccine. And then, you know, the final set of questions have to do with access. You know, when and if we have a vaccine, whether it's 12 or 18 months from now or longer, uh, can we guarantee that the vaccine will get to the people who need it first and, and most? You know, how are we going to prioritize who gets the, the first set of doses of vaccine? Will it be the doctors and nurses? Which countries will get it? You know, if the United States or China pays a company to make a vaccine, do they get um, the first set of vaccines that are manufactured? If CEPI pays for it, CEPI has global access agreements that really kind of guarantee that there will be a decision made um, that will be collective decision about how vaccine will be deployed. And, and that's an, a big unanswered question, and we should start thinking about that now. And it's not just the deployment, presumably, it's, it's the manufacture as well. And, and, you know, manufacturing is going to be a big concern because, you know, there are 7 billion people. And if every single one of them needs the vaccine or as many as we can get, that's billions and billions of doses. That's a lot more vaccine than we normally manufacture in a year. So there are going to need to be big companies involved, companies that know how to make large quantities of vaccines at high quality. And you know, so there's going to be work um, to be done during the time we're testing the vaccine so that when the vaccine is shown to be safe and effective, we have a way to manufacture enough to protect the populations in the world that need it the most.
Jerome Kim, good to have you with us on the programme today. That's Jerome Kim from the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul, South Korea. Thanks.